Hello, I'm Llewellyn King, the host of MECFS Alert, and I'm in beautiful Incline Village, Nevada, about to talk to Dr. Constance Knox, who's from Milwaukee, but has a close association with the institutions out here that are looking for, looking at, looking for a cure, or at least for a, a therapy for chronic fatigue syndrome. In some ways, Incline Village is ground zero for chronic fatigue syndrome because of the outbreak here in 1982. Dr. Knox, welcome to the broadcast. How long have you been interested in this disease? I have been, my group, uh, Dr. Kerrigan and myself, have been working with Dr. Peterson since about 1996. Now, Dr. Peterson, of course, has been here a long time. It's Daniel mm -hmm. Peterson, one of the best-known names in chronic right. fatigue syndrome research and treatment. And the other doctor you mentioned? Uh, Dr. Kerrigan, Kerrigan is, my, is my collaborator and my uh, partner. And what is it that you do that brings you into this orbit? Uh, we began uh, working with Dr. Peterson uh, more than 15 years ago. Um, because of our interest in the, uh, this patient population, especially their neurocognitive component of their illness. So we're an infectious disease group that has worked for many years um, uh, doing, um, uh, developing models for viral infections of the central nervous system. Do you think that chronic fatigue syndrome is an infectious disease? I, I believe that chronic fatigue syndrome is precipitated by an infectious event. I believe that uh, the pathogen may not be cleared. It could set up a persistent infection or alternatively the immune system makes an adaptation and becomes chronically activated again thinking that it's trying to contain whether it's a virus or a bacteria um, and and so over the course of this interaction between the immune system and this infectious event or infectious agent there develops a state of confusion and the immune system doesn't know when it should turn off and over the course of time, it can evolve into an auto-inflammatory um, component and potentially an autoimmune illness. Now, with many chronic diseases, we don't have cures, but we have therapies. That's correct. We have ways of suppressing them mm -hmm. so that people can lead normal lives. These include, I think, diabetes and what else? We have uh, some therapies that have shown benefit in patients with multiple sclerosis. There are now many therapies being applied uh, to different diseases, um, different autoimmune or autoinflammatory diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, um, systemic lupus erythematosus. Uh, we manage diabetes, again, thought to have an underpinning potentially in infection, but also thought to be an autoimmune, autoinflammatory disease. So those are some of probably the more common ones that people would be familiar with. And I personally believe that chronic fatigue syndrome is within that scale of illnesses. Chronic immune activation precipitated by or perpetuated by an infectious agent the immune response to it has been disturbed and, and whenever you're activated immunologically, inflammation, you're not going to feel well and there's going to be very often consequences with respect to neurologic function. Do you believe that that agent that triggers chronic fatigue syndrome to be viral? I think that viruses are excellent candidates. I uh, suspect it could be more than one agent. My own personal bias is I think there's a collaboration of these infectious agents and we have some data to support that. That's true of cancer, isn't it? There are many triggers for cancer. There are, there are many triggers for cancer 
And we have to remember that cancer is a multi-step process. So while a triggering event may be required, it is most often probably not sufficient. So there are steps along the way. You can have cancer triggered by an infectious agent and basically uh, in the world about 20% of cancers have been confirmed to be associated with an infectious agent. But many people are exposed to these agents and they may not get cancer. So other things have to come into play, possibly an environmental exposure to a toxin as well, another assault, possibly your genetic you know, makeup that, that allows for um, the agent to get further along in replication or perhaps you don't clear the infection as readily as someone else. So I think there's multiple steps required for disease to occur. And when that happens, we have blown past all of our, you know, our, our bumper guards or our stop gaps. So it takes a bit to get to disease. There's a sense here, and I've detected in my reporting elsewhere, that we're on the cusp of something that we're about to get something which will at least help in therapy. Do, do you have that feeling that there are breakthroughs hovering on the horizon? With this patient population, the chronic fatigue syndrome, the ME, I think over the last 20 years, we have seen some consistencies in some immunologic disturbances. Um, the NK cell function appears to be not up to speed, that would allow two things. That would allow for viral infections to get further down the road, and that would also allow for an errant tumor cell potentially to get established because the natural killer cells are our surveillance system or one arm of our surveillance system. So we've learned an amount about the patients immunologically, and there's significant overlap between what we see in CFS and what we see in other autoimmune disorders such as multiple sclerosis. Um, I see that CFS is more like MS than it is different. And so I think as we look at therapies that are benefiting patients with rheumatoid arthritis, um, for example, the rituxan studies uh, or uh, MS, these are kind of these are the kind of therapies I think that will one benefit some of these patients, but also they will help us dissect the mechanism of what is going on. We have private research going on all over the country or in spots over the country, mm -hmm. generally underfunded. Uh, where does Cimarron fit into this picture, and how will they move this whole? project forward? I think uh, uh, part, of the, part of the energy with Cimarron, well, it stems from Dr. Peterson, who is a very energetic individual, and Dan Peterson somehow is able to elicit enthusiasm from, from, from investigators from different fields. So again, I was not historically a research in chronic fatigue syndrome. My research was infectious agents in transplant patients, HIV, uh, MS. Um, but Dr. Peterson has individuals such as myself, um, and he is collecting investigators. We, we're, we have a collaboration going with uh, someone whose who's, uh, area of research is cancer and lymphoma. And so what we have going on in Incline Village and in Cimarron Research are groups of individuals who are committed to, again, dissecting the mechanism of what is at the basis of this illness and where can we intervene. And your, your base, your home, is in Milwaukee, but you yes. travel here yeah, quite often. Yes. But you do much of your own research in Milwaukee. I do much of my own research. The laboratory component of my research is done in, in Milwaukee, but many of the ideas, the insights, um, avenues for you know studies, 
come from interactions within the, you know, our group and from other, other individuals that have different expertise, rheumatologists, again, cancer specialists, um, immunologists, all of these and other, you know, specialties. What is the linkage between fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome? They're often used in the same sentence, and uh, they're different. They're different illnesses. They're they're frankly quite quite distinct, but often overlap. So many fibromyalgia patients um, will also have a chronic fatigue syndrome component, or vice versa. You know, or vice versa. So they're 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 they they often travel together, but they don't necessarily have to travel together. Dr. Clinton Knox, it's a joy to talk to you. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. If you would like to sponsor MECFS Alert, please contact us at mecfsalert at gmail.com. Help us to help you.